Grandpa, get your teeth from the water glass. Grandma and Great Grandma fry hot cakes. Son. Ah. Ready? Wake up. My first decision as a child at the age of 11 was to become a magician. My second decision at the age of 12 was to become a short story writer as a result of meeting another magician, Mr. Electrico, who pointed at me on a night when he sat in his electric chair and touched me with his sword of fire. Uh, the, all this blue electricity coming down through his arm and hand, out the sword, touching me on the nose, and he said, live forever. And it was that week I decided to live forever by becoming a writer. I remember the moment and the hour of my birth. I don't know why I should be privileged, if that's the word, to remember that, but I do. I remember lying in my crib during the first week after my birth. I remember being circumcised. I remember suckling at my mother's breast. I checked all of this out with her later. And the nightmares I had in my crib about being born are still very vivid for me. Years later, I wrote a short story called The Small Assassin about a baby with just such a capacity to remember, to see, to know, and to want to revenge its parents for thrusting it out into the world. I was very fortunate in having a maniac mother who couldn't stay away from motion pictures when I was a child. So every chance she had, especially when I was two, three, and four years old, she'd creep off to the local movies and uh, introduce me to those fabulous monsters, people like Lon Chaney and you know, Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Lon Chaney and uh, Phantom of the Opera. So by the time I was seven or eight years old, I was dressing myself up in my grandma's opera cape, putting fangs in my mouth and hanging upside down on trees and dropping on people. Well, this is my nest. And, and what is a nest to a writer? It's bits and pieces of things that changed his life forever, starting when I was three years old, falling in love with motion pictures, grabbing a piece of a film, collecting that, falling in love with the Oz books, collecting the Oz books, you'll find them here, falling in love with science fiction books. Uh, I'm surrounded by science fiction books, comic strips, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, all these things which are my security blankets.
People told me not to collect them, not to read Buck Rogers. So there was never going to be a space age, of course. It was a long time ago. And I listened to them for a while. And I made the mistake of tearing up all my comic strips. And a month or two later, I burst into tears and said to myself, something's terribly wrong. What could it be? Could it be that those people are all wrong telling me what, what to do with my life? And am I right? And I decided I was right. And I went back and collected the Buck Rogers comic strips and became a happy boy again. And from that time on, I never listened to anybody else about taste. I just went ahead and did what I had to do. Now we have a magic set out of my past with all kinds of fantastic goodies in it. And uh, I think part of the fun comes from the colors of these things and uh, the miraculousness of the, of the kind of devices you could find in a box like this. Then if you're very lucky and things are working for you, you make cards appear like that. Hmm? Uh, these things are in the cellar because that's where you keep the naughty boy. Hmm? In other words, if I were upstairs, I would clutter the house. I am a child of my time. I grew up in the tail end of the Industrial Revolution and at the beginning of the Electronic Revolution. Everything's been turned inside out. Therefore, there's no other fiction to write. When people ask, why do you write science fiction? When you grow up with all this pouring into your blood and your eyeballs and ears, tasting it, feeling it, in cities all over the world, there's nothing else to write about. Well, this is my office, my basement in the sky, my annex to my junkyard at home. This is where I come to hide away from telephones and people. People are afraid to come here because uh, we had an earthquake several years ago. I couldn't get into the office. Everything had collapsed. Everything had fallen over. Cleaning people refused to come in because there's so much on the floor, my filing system, that it's impossible to do anything about cleaning. They, they flee the place. When I was a boy, I loved to go out and look at the stars. And when I wasn't looking at the stars, I was busy running through the town wearing my special uh, pair of Lightfoot tennis shoes on my way to somewhere. As I grew older, I looked at the stars more and more, wrote about rocket ships, but I never forgot the shoes. And when I had characters with problems, I would say to them, in effect, put on your tennis shoes and run toward the thing that you want with all your heart. I will follow you. I will write your story. Somehow the people who made tennis shoes knew what the boys needed and wanted. They put marshmallows and coiled springs in the soles, and they wove the rest out of grasses bleached and fired in the wilderness.
people who made those shoes must have watched a lot of winds blow the trees, a lot of rivers going down to the lake. Whatever it was, it was in the shoes, and it was summer. When people ask me where I get my ideas, I laugh. We're all so busy looking out to find ways and means we forget to look in. So if trolleys and runabouts and friends can go away for a while, or go away forever, and if someone like great grandma, who's going to live forever, can die, if all of this is true, then someday I, Douglas Spaulding, must... Douglas Spaulding is most definitely me, uh, uh, a boy who grew up in a small midwestern town, northern Illinois. Uh, very much loved his grandparents, loved the summer days and running through them, loved making dandelion wine with his grandfather. So all of that I've gathered up over the years and put in books like Dandelion Wine. Dandelion Wine. The words were summer on the tongue. The wine was summer caught and stoppered, row upon row, with a soft gleam of flowers open at morning, with the light of this young sun glowing through a faint skin of dust, would stand the dandelion wine. Peer through it at the wintry day. The snow melted to grass. The trees were re-inhabited with bird, leaf, and blossoms, like a continent of butterflies breathing on the wind. I'm a Sunday painter who paints about once a year. And when I do paint, I go back into my childhood and I paint pictures of dandelions in the middle of summer fields. Or in autumn, I paint something like a, a Halloween tree. Death, violence, fantasy, not good for children, nonsense. I've always believed that we should act out our fantasies, put them in stories, put them in films, so we can make do with them, so we don't have to go act them in real life. After all, isn't it true that most of us at one time or another has wanted to kill one of our parents or one of our teachers? A film like Dracula, for me, gives me a chance and others a chance to act out our fears about death. And when we've scared ourselves for an hour, Von Helsing hands us a cedar steak, we put it to Dracula's chest and vam, 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 we kill death, don't we? He walked on to the next table. Good afternoon, Mr. Wren, good afternoon. And how is the master of the racial hatreds today, Mr. Wren? Pure, white, laundered, Mr. Wren, clean as snow, white as linen, Mr. Wren. The man who hated Jews and Negroes, minorities, Mr. Wren, minorities. He pulled back the sheet. Mr. Wren stared up with glassy, cold eyes. Mr. Wren, look upon a member of the minorities, myself, the minority of inferiors, those who speak not above a whisper, those afraid of talking aloud, those frightened little nonentities, mice. Do you know what I'm going to do with you, Mr. Wren? First, let us draw your blood from you, intolerant friend. The blood was drawn off. Now, the injection of, you might say, embalming fluid. Mr. Wren, snow white, linen pure, lay with the fluid going into him. Mr. Benedict laughed. Mr. Wren turned black, black as dirt, black as night. The embalming fluid was ink. Trick or treat. <laughs> well, we're all out of treats. Looks like it's gonna have to be a trick. Okay. We've forgotten where these rituals came from. 
what the witch mask really means, what the skeleton really means. Halloween is an example of the need for fantasy that exists in all of us. And this kind of fantasy and the kind that comes out in horror stories and horror films is our way of dealing with death. When I was a child, I was afraid of the dark. I lived in a house near a ravine on the edge of town. I used to go and stare down into the ravine in the daytime when it was all right. But at night when you went down there, the darkness came out from behind the trees and the rocks and made it very black indeed, very frightening. We knew that someone was waiting for us. That someone was a murderer called the Lonely One. Three minutes from now, I'll be putting my key in my house door. Nothing's happened, has it? No one around, is there? Wait, someone's following me. Someone's behind me. I don't dare turn around. Every time I take a step, they take one. Run. Faster, faster, run. He's following. Don't turn. Don't look. Just run. Run. Oh God, it's dark and everything's so far away. But God, please let me be safe. If I get home safe, I'll never go out alone. safe at home. Look out the window. Where there's no one there at all. Nobody. <gasps> I don't much trust realists because what they want to do is wet your thumb and stick it in a socket. That way you get electrocuted. I would much rather take that energy and cause it to illuminate the world. And Nietzsche has a wonderful quote where he says, we have our arts that we do not die of truth. Huh? That's interesting, isn't it? Huh? That we don't die of reality. By the time we get to be 16 or 17, we know everything there is to know about reality. Huh? That we are born, that we grow up, that we grow old, that we get sick, that we die. Those are the basic facts. And along the way, some terrible things happen to us and some beautiful things happen. But by the time we're 18, 19, 20, we know what they are. And if you just stick with the realists who tell you again and again what you already know, you're never going to learn anything. What we need is interpreters of that same basic truth. And that's my function, to come along and take the familiar cliches and hand them back to you refreshed in some new form so that you'll look at them again, so that reality won't kill you. I was having lunch one day with some Life magazine editors, and they said, where do you get your ideas? We'd been talking about space. We were sitting there eating hamburger steak on which there was a covering of mushrooms. I pointed at the mushrooms. I said, now, what would be a great way to invade Earth? Not the old-fashioned way of spaceships coming down, flying saucers. But what if, since we know that spores do drift down from outer space, some of those spores drifted into a swamp, grew up as mushrooms, the mushrooms come into the city uh, on a farm truck, we put them on our hamburger steak, we eat them, and we turn into something very strange. As soon as I said it, I said, that's a wonderful idea. Pardon me, I'm going to go write it. There was the faintest whisper, rustle, stir from the cellar. Taking his eyes from the bowl, Fortnum walked to the cellar door and put his ear to it. Tom? Tom, are you down there? Tom? Yes, Dad? What are you doing down there? I said... Tending my crop. 
Well, now you get up out of there. You hear me? Tom, listen. Did you put some mushrooms in the refrigerator tonight? Yes. Why? For you and Mom to eat, of course. Now, Tom. You haven't by any chance eaten some of the mushrooms yourself, have you? Funny you should ask that. Dad, come on down. I want you to see the harvest. Dad? Don't. Light's bad for mushrooms. I suppose I should say goodbye to my wife. But why should I think that? Why should I think that at all? No reason, is there? None. Years ago, I wrote a short story called Ascent of Sarsaparilla. It was a story of an old man for whom everything was going wrong. Nothing was right in his life at all. His wife was yelling at him all the time, so he took to climbing up into the attic to sort of hide out and, and guard himself against reality. He began to look around that attic. He realized, in a way, it was a kind of time machine. And late on in the story, he went and looked out the back window of the attic and saw down below the year 1905 or 198 when things were younger and better, at least for him. I had to attack the senses of the reader in order to make the reader believe in my fantasy. And when you think about it, a, an attic truly is a time machine. I had allowed the reader to run their hand over the plush, open old uh, uh, attic trunks, look at dress forms, giant chandeliers put by, toys from another time. And when I described each of these things in great detail through the sense of smell and seeing, hearing, tasting, I finished the story and it worked. People believed in the fantasy of the time machine attic going back in time. And at the end of the story, the old man climbed through the back window, out of the attic, and disappeared forever. When you think of American writers 100 years ago, all of a sudden you think of magicians, don't you? At least I do. Uh, Herman Melville, Edgar Allan Poe, Washington Irving, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. They were all illusionists who could do incredible things. The birds! He rises! In an auditorium! It was while writing the screenplay of Moby Dick for John Huston that I surprised myself by discovering that at one time Melville had never read Shakespeare and suddenly fell upon him, took his novel that he was working on about whales and ships, threw it out the window and started over and birthed Moby Dick. So suddenly I found myself in familiar territory with Shakespeare, whom I had loved since I was 14 years old. <laughs> myself with Moby Dick to the extent of reading some parts of the novel 50 or 60 times over, some scenes 80 times over, until a day finally came in London when I got out of bed, walked over to the mirror, and said to myself, I am Herman Melville. And on that day, I rewrote the last fourth of the screenplay, 40 pages, in a single afternoon. From hell's heart, I sympathy for hate's sake, I spent my last breath at thee, thou damned whale!
I was walking with a friend, this is about 30 years back, along Wilshire and Western Avenue, and a police car pulled up, and the policeman got out and came over to us and said, what are you doing? And I said, I said, putting one foot in front of the other, which was the wrong answer. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and the more the policeman talked to me, the more upset I got, because I felt I wasn't a criminal. I had done nothing that I could remember, anyway, to be questioned on the street. And I looked around suddenly, and I realized how great a distance it was toward the west with no pedestrians and toward the east with no one walking and uh, all the side streets, nobody doing anything. And uh, we were isolated, this other chap and myself, walking at night. And uh, the more I talked, the more I realized I was making trouble for myself. I became so frustrated that at a certain point, I reached into my pocket and took out a packet of soda crackers and put them in my mouth and chewed on them. And as I talked to the policeman, I sprayed him with flakes. <laughs> now, I. I've never been able to figure out whether I did this on purpose or whether uh, there's some subconscious thing going on there. And the policeman looked down at the flakes on his uniform, and he looked like the night sky with the Andromeda Nebula here and Orion over here. And he couldn't decide whether I was being hostile or not. All right, stand still. Stay where you are, don't move. Put up your hands. Your hands up or we'll shoot. Your name? Ray Bradbury. Speak up. Ray Bradbury. What are you doing now? Walking. Walking? Walking, just walking? Walking? Yes, sir. Walking where, for what? To breathe the air, to see things. Have you done this often? Every night for years. Well, Mr. Bradbury. Is that all? Yes. Here. Get in. But you don't understand. I haven't done anything. Get in. I wrote The Pedestrian, a story of a time 50 years from now when a man is arrested by a robot car. He has taken off for a clinical study because he insists on looking at untelevised reality and breathing unair conditioned air. And uh, about a year later, two years later, I took that story out and I was looking at some other notes about firemen. And I suddenly decided to take that pedestrian out for a walk again. And I went to my typewriter, started walking the pedestrian, changed the sex to a girl, Clarice McClellan had her turn a corner and smell kerosene, and nine days later, Fahrenheit 451 was finished as a novel. So thank God for that policeman, huh? Tell me, that number you all wear, what's it mean? Oh, Fahrenheit 451. Why 451 rather than 813 or 12? Fahrenheit 451 is a temperature at which book paper catches fire and starts to burn. Look, isn't that lovely? The pages, like... Like flower petals or butterflies, luminous and black. Who can explain the fascination of fire? What draws us to it, whether we're young or old? The McCarthy period, the Joseph McCarthy period, I consider to be one of the strangest semi-frightening and ridiculous periods in American history. I myself wasn't so much afraid of him as I was angered by him. Uh, as a result of this, believing in the power of the individual, I wrote a whole series of short stories which turned into novels, the final novel being Fahrenheit 451. Is it true that a long time ago, firemen used to put out fires and not burn books? Oh, really, your uncle is right. You are light in the head. Put fires out. Who told you that? Oh, I don't know. Someone. But is it true? Did they? Oh, what a strange idea. In the midst of writing about the future, I sat down and exploded politically about the future by putting together an advertisement 
which I paid for myself with $200 I didn't truly have. Get to your work now, remembering that you have good men in your party if you put them to work. But in the name of all that is right and good and fair, let us send Joseph McCarthy and his friends back to Salem in the 17th century. My friend said, it's no use. He's going to stay in power forever. He's going to hurt a lot of people. I said, I refuse to be frightened. Let's attack. So I said, the individual has great power. I believe that McCarthy will be destroyed by one or two people. That's how it turned out. Edward R. Murrow with his television show on McCarthy, uh, Mr. Welsh, the lawyer at the Army trial, uh, turning on McCarthy and saying, finally, at long last, sir, have you no decency? And down the drain went McCarthy. It is your special book. It's got to be burned with the others, and you're under arrest. saying, well, are, uh, what do you predict for the future? You're writing these depressing books. I don't mean to depress. I mean to use my uh, books as weapons to prevent futures rather than to predict them. And uh, I'm optimistic about the future, or I wouldn't be writing the way I write. If I really believed the future was going to be as dark as Orwell said, or Aldous Huxley said, I would tomorrow go out and eat a ton of pickles and 16 Clark bars and, and 13 Cadbury's and, and get the hell out of the world. drive ever in my life. Number one, because I was very poor growing up as a writer. Number two, I'm afraid of automobiles. It's ours to choose. You can create good machines or bad machines. A machine that has humanity embodied in it is a good machine. We can create machines in the future that lock humanity into them and therefore change the entire aspect of technology. And now, the skills of the sculptor and the talents of the artist will let us relive great moments with Mr. Lincoln. at Disneyland, but the future of America for me is in the kind of planning that's going on here. Machines of this sort are very helpful in the world. I'm tired of the cliches about computers, machines, being terrible monsters. It would be like walking by a library and saying, aren't you terrified of libraries? And that's what a computer is. It's a library, but it doesn't look like one. It's an incredible place where the first monorails have been built, the first real studies of 
what people are in relationship to one another. The elimination of elbows, how to get rid of mobs and turn them into crowds, that's very important. I think the future of America is in studying a place like this. Race through icy caverns and crystal caves. Uh, I encouraged the wet people, the Disney people, over the years to bring their robots uh, and their computers and their plans and apply them to the problems of the small town. And when Uncle Walt was alive, I said to him once, Walt, I wish you would run for mayor of Los Angeles. And he said, Ray, why should I be mayor when I'm already king? There we go. Hi there, how you doing? God bless. <laughs> Andy's one of his favorite his friends. Hi, except I'm your favorite. Yeah, I'm your bestest friend. I'm fascinated with the idea that machines are as paradoxical as mankind is itself. Over the years, you consider the fact that atom power can be used to blow up the world or to illuminate the world. So I've written just as many short stories over a long period of time attacking technology as I have defending it. Tick tock, seven o'clock. Time to get up, time to get up, seven o'clock. Seven, nine, breakfast time, seven, nine. Today is August the 4th, 2026. Today is Mr. Featherstone's birthday. Eight, one, tick. Talk. Eight, one o'clock. Off to school, off to work. Run, run, eight, one. The entire west face of the house was black, save for five places. Here, the silhouette and paint of a man mowing a lawn. Here, as in a photograph, a woman bent to pick flowers. Still farther over, their images burned on wood in one titanic instant, a small boy, hands flung into the air, higher up, the image of a thrown ball, and opposite him, a girl, hands raised to catch a ball, which never came down. The five spots of paint, the man, the woman, the children, the ball remained. The rest was a thin, charcoal layer. The gentle sprinkler rain filled the garden with falling light. Fire, help, help, fire, run, run! Help, help, fire, burning, run, run, fire, help, help, burning, fire, run! Seven, run, breakfast, fire, help, Seven, nine. help, help, help. When I was a young man, I looked at the shelves at the library, saw the empty places, and said to myself, how do I get there? How do I put myself on that shelf? The answer was to write a book that would scare the hell out of myself. We all love that. To write books about boys sneaking around at midnight, doing secret things out in the backyard, climbing trees, going into haunted houses, that sort of wonderful adventure. If I could write that, maybe I'd wind up on the shelf. Out in the world, not much happened. But here, in the special night, 
a land bricked with paper and leather. Anything might happen. Always did. Listen, and you heard 10,000 people screaming so high, only dogs feathered their ears. title for my novel from Shakespeare's play Macbeth. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. These illustrations are all right through the day, but at night they move. For you see, said the illustrated man. These pictures predict the future. one of my favorite books, mainly because I found my father by surprise in it a few years ago. My father died some 23 years back. I wrote the book 20 years ago, published it 18 years ago, didn't read it for many years after. One night about eight or nine years ago, prowling around my house late, picked up the book, read a whole chapter about this man, this father in the book, and burst into tears. It was my father hidden away at the heart of the book, very special, very loving, very good. And that's why it's my favorite book. Me, said his father, I'm the original sad man. I read a book and it makes me sad. See a film, sad. Plays, and they really work me over. Is there anything, said Will, doesn't make you sad? One thing, death. Boy, Will started. I should think that would. No, said the man with a voice to match his hair. Death makes everything else sad, but death itself only scares it. If there wasn't death, well, all the other things wouldn't get tainted. And Will thought, here comes the carnival. Death like a rattle in one hand, life like candy in the other. Shake one to scare you, offer one to make your mouth water. Here comes the sideshow, both hands full. thrusting, the music gasped after, while Mr. Cougar, as simple as shadows, as simple as time, got younger and younger and younger.
The days being short now, simply I had come to gaze and look and stare upon the thought of that once endless maze of afternoons. But most of all, I wished to find the places where I ran as dogs do run before or after boys. I think one of the basic secrets of life is doing things because you want to do them and not because someone pays you. And that's been true for me. I've been writing poetry for 40 years or so that nobody wanted to read, uh, even myself at times. And now, very late in time, the poetry is getting pretty good. I'm beginning to publish it. I came upon an oak where once when I was 12, I had climbed up and screamed for Skip to get me down. It was a thousand miles to earth. I shut my eyes and yelled. Help! My brother, richly compelled to mirth, gave shouts of laughter and scaled up to rescue me. What were you doing there, he said. I did not tell, but I was there to place a note within a squirrel nest on which I had written some old secret thing now long forgot. Now, in the green ravine of middle years, I stood beneath that tree. Why, why, I thought, my God, it's not so high. Why did I shriek? What awe. The squirrel's whole and long lost nest were there. I lay upon the limb a long while thinking. I drank in all the leaves and clouds and weathers going by as mindless as the days. What, what, what if, I thought. But no, some 40 years beyond. The note I'd put, it's surely stolen off by now. I put my hand to the nest. I dug my fingers deep, nothing and still more nothing. Yet digging further, I brought forth the note like moth wings neatly powdered on themselves and folded close, it had survived. I opened it, for now I had to know. I opened it and wept. I clung then to the tree and let the tears flow out and down my chin. Dear boy, strange child who must have known the years and reckoned time and smelled sweet death from flowers in the far churchyard, what did it say that made me weep? I remember you. I remember you. I remember you. People are always saying, what are you? Are you a science fiction writer? Are you a fantasy writer? I say, no. I am what I started out to be, a magician. Everyone, close off. Brush teeth. Now, out with the lights. 